Hey everyone, this video is a short interview that I had with a couple members of the Halborn team and Cosmwasm developers. Now, Halborn is a company that I'm spending some time with and chatting about Web3 and blockchain technology. And I know, hey, before you like jump out of your chair and run away, it's all about cyber security. It's all about the vulnerabilities, the bugs, the flaws, the software weaknesses that might end up plaguing, hey, the whole technology space that some people are really interested in. So whether or not you're a fan of, oh, buy one cryptocurrency or one NFT or whatever, whatever, whatever. No, I want to put that all away and I want us to focus on security. That's what this is all about. It's a new technology space that we're trying to learn the ins and outs so that we can get it right. So that there aren't vulnerabilities and zero days and bugs and flaws and we can keep rocking as cybersecurity professionals. So with that said, I'm sorry for that kind of disclaimer. I hope you enjoy the video and get to learn a little bit more about that new technology space. Thanks, everybody. Alrighty, well, hey, thanks so much for tuning in. Anyone uh, stumbling across this video here, but I uh, am excited and interested to chat with these folks on uh, a new vulnerability that's been kind of introduced and uh, remediated. But before we get the ball rolling, I would like to let these gentlemen introduce themselves. So Simon, can I kick it off to you? Who are you, my friend? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm Simon, one of the co-founders of Confio. I, um, my background is software development. Um, I work on Cosmosm development for the last two years. Um, Cosmosm is a smart contracting engine uh, for the Cosmos. Um, yeah, I'm doing that. I'm the managing director of Confio. Um, and yeah, a little bit of software, a little bit of management. Awesome. Stephen, hey, uh, I want to give you the opportunity to introduce you and your team. For sure. So I'm Stephen Wabra, one of the co-founders for Halborn. Uh, Halborn is a blockchain enterprise end-to-end -end security firm. Um, we, uh, you know, we have a team of almost 80 engineers now, and uh, you know, Lewis is with me here on one of them. Um, so glad to be here, John. Thanks for having us. Lewis, tell me about yourself, my friend. Hey, hey, guys. Well, I'm Luis Quispe Gonzalez. Uh, I have been involved in offensive security for around 12 years. Uh, now I'm leading the Cosmos Watson security team at Harvard. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much, everyone. I'm excited to get this group together and just chat a little bit. Uh, but Lewis, I think you might be the one kind of setting the stage for the story here. Uh, from what I understand, you uncovered an interesting gimmick, a little flaw, a little bug, a vulnerability. Do you mind telling me about what you discovered? Yeah, sure, sure. I will try to do a quick and a not so technical summary of what the vulnerability is about. So if we start from the basics and we talk about addresses, uh, in general sense, the addresses, uh, I mean general sense because it can vary from one blockchain to another, but it represents a user or a smart contract in a blockchain. It's like an alias. So uh, does it mean that any user can create any, any address with whatever combination of letter or numbers uh, I don't know, like Porky 001, no so fast. Depending on the blockchain you are, with, you are dealing with, uh, the format you use will be different. So for example, in Ethereum, uh, talking about, uh, about Ethereum, uh, they use a uh, hexadecimal format. So all the addresses uh, has uh, exa 42 hexadecimal characters. That's Ethereum. On the other hand, if we talk about blockchains that are built upon Cosmos SDK, they use a format called BEG32. And what's that? It's a format that has three parts. The first part, it's called a human readable format. And basically it's just a string that identifies a blockchain. For example, if we talk about Terra, the human readable part, it's called Terra. In secret network, it's called secret and so on. Uh, a second component is the separator that in this format, it's just, it's always the number one. And the final part, it's called the data part, that is uh, at least six character long, and it's a combination of alphanumeric uh, uh, characters. We only exclude four characters. There are the one, the B, the I, and the O. At the end, we have 32 characters to play with. That's the white of the name. So uh, what is really interesting is that the BEG32 format uh, specifies that the addresses can be all lowercase or, or uppercase, but not a mix. So what did we find here? Cosmos SDK change that used Cosmos Watson as a smart contracted platform uh, did not normalize the address. What does it mean? That when you verify an address in Cosmos Watson, the lowercase version and the uppercase version 
are treated as different addresses. And if you consider this issue and the fact that many developers are not aware of all, all this stuff about lowercase, uppercase version, uh, it creates a scenario where an attacker can completely bypass validity checks in the contracts uh, under certain conditions. In fact, we identify uh, this vulnerability in different DeFi protocols uh, that now are patched, of course. I would like to support like that last point. Um, developers are not aware of that. I am working in this technology and building on this technology and looking into the specifications and writing um, uh, implementation in both JavaScript and Rust for two or three years now, and I was not aware of that. Um, so uh, this is really something that only exists because it allows you to efficiently encode um, addresses in QR codes. Um, and this is why it was included in the specification. It's nowhere out there in the real world. Nobody has ever seen this, but it's, it's legal um, and proper implementations accept both forms. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Simon. I'm glad that you were kind of chiming in there because I, I did want to turn it over to both you and Steven because I, I realize and I understand, hey, with discussion of vulnerability, with discussion of this thing, it's a, a bit, hey, fragile and sensitive. So I'd like I'd, I'm more than happy to let you kind of color the picture in here. What is Cosmwasm and Cosmos and all this? Uh, and why is this vulnerability so important to address? And what are the odds and ends of it that we might not be thinking of? Yeah, I can start so, really quick, and then Simon's the, sure. the expert with the language for sure. Um, yeah, he gets big deals, but what you know, finding things like this, uh, an example of what could happen um, is you can like bypass validity checks, you could duplicate liquidity pools, uh, you could permanently lock tokens uh, with this if you exploit it. So the impact is uh, very, very severe uh, if it is exploited, and um, the blockchain is something where people lock their funds on there, so there could be you know, millions, potentially billions at stake sometimes. Um, so this is a big risk. And, uh, you know, uh, Cosmos was one of the languages uh, that, that uh, supports and is built on all this. So, you know, Simon can explain a little bit about the language. So, yeah, I can explain a little bit about the module system of Cosmos in general. So Cosmos is, or Cosmos SDK to be specific, is a framework to build um, layer one blockchains. So every blockchain that is built on Cosmos SDK is running completely independent, but they share a set of basic components, um, off the shelf components, things like governance or basic tokens. You don't want to re-implement that for every blockchain that you use. And also you don't want to build your own clients for every blockchain that you create. So it's gotten kind of handy to share common functionality between different blockchains. Um, but it's still modular. You can choose what you want to have. You can add your own things. You can also um, customize the things that exist because they are kind of what you want, but not exactly. Um, and one of the modules um, that Confio created for the Cosmos SDK, uh, we are not the creators of Cosmos SDK, um, but we are the creators of one particular module for the Cosmos SDK. And that is Cosmwasm or, or XWasm in Go speak. Um, and that allows you to um, add a smart contracting virtual machine to your chain um, that allows you to dynamically run code that is uploaded either by um, arbitrary users um, in a per permissionless way, like we are seeing on Juno or Terra um, or Secret Network, or you can um, use it in a permissioned way where only governance is allowed to upload smart contracts. Um, this is something that we are seeing in Stargaze and Osmosis, for example. Um, so uh, even there with this module that we provide, it's still very easy to configure it in the way that you want it to be configured. And uh, yeah, usually in Cosmos SDK, people, um, decode their back 32 addresses um, to raw bytes. And as soon as you do that, you don't mind which printable representation was used before. 
um, because they, if it's uppercase, lowercase, it doesn't matter, they all contain the same data. Now, this is how the specification was written. But then for writing smart contracts, we wanted to make it a little bit easier and a little bit more convenient and a little bit more user-friendly, developer-friendly, easy to print, easy to debug. Yeah, you know this stuff. And we took a little bit of a shortcut, uh, which was uh, then creating um, the issue. We uh, basically encouraged the user to say, ah, yeah, you can use this um, printable representation straight away. You don't have to um, convert it to the raw bytes. Um, and this is something that was not the way the specification intended to, and we got bite by that um, because, yeah, um, there are obviously uh, two different representation of the same uh, address, um, which, which we were not aware of. Um, and this is something that is particularly an issue in Cosmosm smart contracting. Some of, of the smart contracts, not all of them, if you convert them to raw bytes, which you can, um, you don't have this, this issue at all. Um, we don't see that in Cosmos SDK development um, because there you always work with addresses uh, based on raw bytes. Um, you always decode the address when, when you get it in and you encoded it when you get it out. But for all the computations, it's always uh, used in, in raw bytes representation. So it's really something that is happening on the Cosmosm stack. Um, it's our fault completely our fault because we did not see this in the specification. Um, but we find, found a good way to fix it now. And, and there's, um, you know, for, for those maybe unfamiliar with, with blockchain, uh, there's, I think, 20 different blockchains deployed out that are using Cosm Wasm um, underneath it and other variations of it. You know, Solidity is a really popular one for like Ethereum. That's the language that you code smart contracts in. And there's also uh, some blockchains that use something called Substrate like Polkadot, um, uh, there's Haskell is used for like Cardano. Um, so Cosmosm is, is one of those that's providing a mix of the Cosmos SDK for it's kind of like the network consensus layer. Uh, and then the Wasm, which is you know, the web assembly, which is in Rust and usually runs the programs and contracts on top of that. So it's a mix for it. So this is that, that particular chain here. Uh, ones like, like Terra, which is probably the most popular uh, and, the, and the largest that people have heard. Can I ask, Simon, um, what were kind of the steps taken to go ahead and fix that? I mean, from my understanding, hey, it's the differentiation between lowercase and uppercase. Uh, do you just force lowercase? Do you take some better normalization and validation in that address verify function? Or uh, what did you do to fix this here? So when we received this report from uh, Hellborn, we really thought about, okay, at which level of the stack do we have to fix this? Um, because obviously you could blame the contract developers and said, yeah, you have to convert this to raw bytes, it's your problem. However, we encourage them to use the printable representation, so it's also kind of our problem. And also we don't want to leave everybody out there with deployed smart contracts um, in, in a very dangerous situation with this. So the question was, can we uh, find a way to fix this on the chain in a way that once it's patched on the chain, it's uh, the patches available to all smart contracts, the ones that are already deployed, as well as the ones that are newly deployed. Um, so we, we thought about that and realized, okay, we have address validation and it's not super clearly defined when an address is considered valid. So since this is not clearly defined, we thought, okay, we have a little bit of freedom here. We can say, okay, afterwards we define that more strictly than we did when we originally created the function. And we said, okay, this um, does not only, uh, an address that we get in does not only need to be um, valid uh, back uh, 32, but it also needs, in addition to that, needs to be normalized. And normalized means when you decode it and encode it again, you get the same value. Um, and that means uh, in practice that it has to be lowercase because lowercase is the primary representation, that one that you get when you, when you create a new uh, back 32 address. Um, there's another aspect that makes this a little bit trickier, which is that the Cosm Wasm stack does not know which address format the chain uses. So this, it's completely transparent for the uh, virtual machine um, what the format is. It just says here, chain, please verify this address for me. Um, 
So it would be very well possible to deploy Cosm Wasm on a blockchain that does not use um, back 32, but use Hex, for example. And there we have the same situation. Um, if you have the address format that is popular in, in Ethereum, um, there can be mixed case representations of the same address. And the fix that we found then after carefully considering the options was one that not only works for PEC32, but also works for HEX and DID and whatever address formats people are already brainstorming for, uh, for the future. Cool. I'm going to momentarily break the fourth wall. Um, I don't know if there's more that you all would like to chat about. Uh, am I forgetting anything or hey, should we just start to ask, do you have any last closing thoughts, words of advice? I absolutely want to hit Lewis one more time and say, hey, um, from your perspective as the security researcher, uh, how likely is it to see other vulnerabilities like this down the line, other things that other hey developers might need to know throughout more security cases like this. Is there anything else that we want to talk about, folks? Because uh, again, yeah, hey, this really is quick. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I could talk about um, you know just in general, um, Halborn and security researchers like Lewis. Uh, yes, when we find these issues, uh, you know it's it's very sensitive. Just in general for security, finding these zero days can be a bit of a of a, a tricky uh, subject of maintaining you know secrecy while getting fixed. Uh, to make sure that it's not exploited for that time in between. Um, it's unique with blockchain aspects because things happen so fast. You know, if a if a vulnerability like this is found or something like on Ethereum, a Solidity Zero Day, uh, people can anonymously go and on chain and start liquidating funds or you know uh, leveraging the exploit to to steal or you know lock funds out of there. So you know it happens extremely fast. So there has to be a lot of care involved with that and make sure that. Um, notification is done to the projects that may be impacted and patches are put out there too. So um, that, that's one thing that we, we try to take care of and uh, you know, work with all the individuals that are impacted to make sure that um, you know, everybody's funds are protected here and we get the patch out there. So we, great job working with uh, Confio and you know, Simon, your team was uh, very, very cooperative. It was a pleasure like, going through and you know, helping the community with this fix. Yeah, I'm aware, hey, there was a, a patch released on the 6th of April, is that right? How are you feeling, Simon? Uh, <laughs> um, 6th of April. Uh, I know it was Wednesday last week. Um, but yeah, um, in addition to that, in this particular case, um, it's even more tricky because Cosm Wasm is an open source framework. So the moment we release um, a patch does not mean it is shipped to the end user. Uh, it is shipped to the project that built on top of our software stack. So um, at that moment, um, it's really uh, up to the chains um, that, that use our software to, um, to react quickly. And we have, um, we have security communication lines with a lot of major chains. But to be honest, we don't know who our users are. We know a handful of them, um, but it's open source. Everybody can use it. I don't know who's using what version of Cosm Wasm. Um, it's already so many users, we can't keep track of, of all of them anymore. And you know, it's, it's usually like uh, in traditional security, like the Windows, you know, patches come out and all the security researchers and hackers start diffing the, between the different patches, find out what did they change? What did they change? Is it, is it because of a vulnerability? And then you know, see how they can reverse engineer that to exploit it. Same thing happens here. Yeah, even worse. I mean, the, the, the patch is open source. It's not that <laughs> yeah. you have to reverse engineer anything. You just have to understand the patch. Yep. The logic. Yeah. I find the logic what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, and I would like to, under, to to highlight an important aspect, and it's that uh, the patch is out there. Uh, you can use it, but of course, uh, the, the key the key uh, part is that you you have to use it. It's like having a super anti cross site scripting library that can do whatever. But if the developer does not use that library, at the end, uh, the input output uh, on a web a web page can create a cross site scripting situation. It's the same here. If you don't, if the developer doesn't uh, validate the function with a, uh, the, the address, I mean, if he doesn't validate the address with a address validated function, uh, at the end, uh, it will happen again. And that's why it's important to the awareness for the developers about what are the uh, key issues in the in the cost of, well actually in the blockchain uh, world uh, in, in this particular case in that cost wasn't um, uh, uh, contracted platform so 
just, just to highlight what are those uh, key aspects they should focus to not uh, to not create bugs in the smart contract. Absolutely. Um, so education is, is key. Um, we are working on improving the um, the documentation. We are launching Cosm Bosom Academy uh, later this year as Confio, which is uh, a training program that um, guides newcomers through um, the basics of Cosm Bosom. And uh, we'll make sure to get uh, a lot of well-educated um, Cosm Bosom smart contract developers out there who avoid the basic mistakes. Uh, we can share some of the uh, possible consequences that can happen because of this issue. Um, uh, for example, we are talking about bypass validity check. What does it, what does it uh, mean? Uh, what is the effect in the defined uh, world? Yeah. For example, uh, you can imagine a scenario where you try, uh, in the logic of the contract, you try to, to validate if an ad in a particular address uh, should be different to another one to continue the processing to another one or to a, a set of others. So this, this kind of validity checks can be completely bypassed just by just using the, the uppercase version of the address. And you can start a uh, continue processing and it will work because uh, at the end, you can use those addresses uh, as valid ones. And what are the effects uh, in this kind of scenarios? We have seen, for example, it can it can affect uh, the funds in a contract, it can affect the reward distribution, it can affect the vesting schedule for different uh, protocols. Uh, another case we, we saw, it's about the liquidity pools. If, for example, we talk about the automated uh, market maker, uh, one key aspect here is to have a high liquidity pool. So uh, here I have two, uh, two cases. Uh, but what is the key idea behind that? For example, that's uh, that's a, a code that we have seen on the wheel uh, in the DeFi protocol. So for example, here you see that in this part of code, in a liquidity pool, in this case, in an AMM, you try to verify if a pool for a particular uh, pair of tokens exists or not. If it exists, you don't allow to create another liquidity pool for that uh, Pair of tokens, and that's important because for those kind of protocol, if you fragment the liquidity, that's bad for the protocol. That's bad for the user. It increases the fees, and it's not work. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> uh, so in this case, if you see uh, here, here you have uh, the key for the pairs, and uh, if you see that the code of of this function, you see that uh, at the end you turn uh, the information about the asset that at the end, are, uh, if you see here, it's just uh, an address, uh, you turn this into bytes. And this function tries to verify if a specific pair exists or not. So uh, if, you, if you create a pair with the, uh, a token with a contract address that it's in uppercase, you can create a repeated pool and you can do it uh, until four times. At the end, you have for liquidity pools, and again, you fragment the liquidity for, for the AMM protocol, and it uh, it creates the, that unexpected situation. Uh, some consequences are reduction of pool liquidity, that is key, as I mentioned, and in some scenarios, it even helps attackers to bypass other restrictions to withdraw more tokens than they should. That's obviously, again, bad for the protocol. Um, another example for money market, uh, for example, here, uh, you try to execute a swap, uh, a, a specific asset to USD. So if you see the code uh, here, uh, it contains an address. And uh, if, if we see the implementation, you see that, that you, are, you are comparing the input contract address against uh, a specific one. And so uh, if you, you can bypass this restriction by using an uppercase version of the others. Consequences, an attacker can swap all or almost all uh, tokens uh, and legitimate user won't be able to unstate their tokens or, or will receive a return much less than expected. From my side, it has been clear that, uh, well, it's been another incident that shows that blockchains really need to think about their um, security patch policies 
Um, we have seen um, groups discussing putting out uh, community proposals to upgrade software and this kind of stuff in a situation where uh, you should have acted yesterday and can't afford to put out a community proposal to vote on a software upgrade for one or two weeks. Um, this is not a, a software development problem. This is not Confio's problem, but this is something that the ecosystem has not answered. Yep. Yeah, there's a... Um some ecosystem problems just in the way blockchain works and some of the community where, you know, if you have a operating system like, you know, a Windows update, you know, you'll get those notifications to patch it. But sometimes it's a, you know, your responsibility, just like Bitcoin, where you become the bank and you're responsible for, you know, holding your funds and your key, uh, you're responsible to manage your nodes sometimes to update uh, your validators uh, sets and chain for it. And so, um, yeah, if you're involved with with this or an, an ecosystem contributor or something in a somebody in a DAO, then uh, you know you have some responsibility of security that you have to take seriously and be a bit more proactive. Yeah, uh, as as you know, security in the blockchain world is relatively new, comparing for let's say traditional technologies like like uh, the web world or the mobile world. So. Uh, we are working actually we, we we research about these topics we try to to create a like a top like, like always top 10 uh, a top 10 of, of common issues that affects uh, the blockchain world uh, in different flavors here in, in Kosovo but for, for different blockchain uh, and our idea is to to share this info with the community too to so developers are aware of this kind of, of, of issues that could happen if they don't take into in consideration in the development of these smart contracts. All righty. Well, hey, thank you so much, all. This was uh, enlightening. I think it's, it's, it's fascinating for me to see, and I hope for others listening in, uh, that whole world of security even applied to that blockchain and Web3 uh, ecosystem. It's something that we do have to take seriously, each and every one of us, uh, and it's a burden to bear at from every perspective, developer, user, et cetera. Uh, thanks so much for setting, shedding some light on this, everyone. <laughs> thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you guys.